Hi, everyone. Welcome back this week. Now, some of you requested me to do an update on COVID and its new subvariant. And I also thought it was about time to have an update since my last COVID video almost two months ago. So let's cut to the chase. Let's look at this new Omicron subvariant, XBB.1.16. Social media gave this new Omicron subvariant a new nickname, Arturus. It has created a new case wave in India, but the reported number is not as high as the previous Omicron wave about nine months ago in India. This wave pattern may not be applicable to other countries because a lot of the northern hemisphere countries with colder winters have had a small winter surge already. Right now, the XBB.1.16 accounts for about 10% of reported cases in the U.S. Now, notice that I use the term reported cases because COVID cases are not tracked as closely as last year. Genetic-wise, the XBB.1.16 only has one more mutation than the current leading subvariant, XBB.1.5. But it looks like this new additional mutation is giving it some advantage in infectivity. No evidence shows that 1.16 is more severe than 1.5, but 1.16 is associated with new red eye or pink eye itchy symptoms. Now, this is a little troublesome to tell because itchy red eye overlaps with seasonal allergy symptoms. The itchy eye symptom is also reported more in pediatric COVID patients in India. Another notable new variant is the XBC1.6. It is a fusion of the Delta and BA2 Omicron. Now, it accounts for more than 30% of cases in South Australia in March. The Delta variant was a bad memory for many countries, but so far there's no indication that XBC1.6 is the combination of the worst of the two. Now, COVID hospitalization does not appear to be more worrisome than in the past, according to Australia data. Now, it's noteworthy that all of these new variants or new subvariants do not show any significant surges in hospitalizations, unlike the previous waves that we had experienced, which implies our immunity against COVID is holding up from either natural infection, vaccination, or a combination of the two. This brings us to our next talking point. The US FDA has authorized the second Omicron booster and CDC ACIP also met on April 19th to discuss why and who is recommended for the second Omicron booster. So let's take a look at the question of whom first. The CDC language has softened for this round of the booster. 65 and above may choose to receive the spring booster if it has been at least four months since the previous bivalent booster. Now, using age as a cutoff is not ideal because age does not necessarily define a person's overall health status. It is the most simplified language, but not the most scientific. According to the CDC data, less than half of all eligible 65 over have received their first bivalent booster, standing at 42.4%. You probably ask why the spring booster? CDC presented data that shows vaccine effectiveness waning against hospitalization. The efficacy for bivalent vaccines among those over 65 years old decreased from 64% to 39%. The biggest problem with the CDC data, which has been consistent ever since three years ago, is that they don't separate hospitalized with COVID-19 versus for COVID-19. But this time, the CDC did provide some hint at how well the first bivalent booster protects against hospitalization for COVID with data related to mechanical ventilation or deaths. Now, we can see that protection against ventilator use has not waned for all adults with functional immune systems, even just with two to four doses of the monovalent vaccine. 
The second group of people may consider a second bivalent booster are those who are immunocompromised and six and up. Now, unfortunately, other than a booster every two months or so, and as needed after receiving immunosuppressant therapies, there are very few things we can do to help these patients because their adaptive immune systems are generally severely. Decreased or diminished, and they do not generate as many effector cells such as antibody-producing plasma cell, helper, and cytotoxic T cells, and as well as memory T and B cells from either infection or vaccination. Now that brings us to the next question: What has happened to our immunological memory with COVID nineteen? Now, why does the official consistently recommend or suggest boosters at a frequency unlike any other vaccines we have had in the past? Shouldn't we have sufficient immunological memory? Like, what happened to memory? T cells and B cells after vaccinations, right? Now those questions have been asked numerous times by the vaccine advisory committee members ever since the mRNA vaccine rolled out. But both the FDA and the manufacturers have been avoiding answering these questions directly by saying it's too difficult to measure. Let's look at the new study on memory T cells. This new study just published in early April 2023 in Nature Communication that compared memory T cells induced by COVID infection versus mRNA vaccination. Now, the main finding from this study was that the research team showed mRNA vaccination induced less polyfunctional lung resident memory T cells than infection. Let's break down the major findings and have a little more explanation of all the terms used in the study. Forty-nine healthy lung tissues and blood were collected from patients who underwent lung surgeries. Now, of the forty-nine samples, thirty were included in the main study. The patient samples were broken down into four groups. Covalent infected were those who recovered and did not receive any mRNA vaccines. Control was those who were not infected and unvaccinated. The vaccinated had two groups. First one, short-term mRNA were one to two months after three or four doses, and the second group is the long-term mRNA. Uh, were those four to ten months after two to three doses? Now the short-term mRNA group samples were from older patients, and notice that, which makes sense because they are the group who were recommended for more and earlier booster doses. The study showed that the covalent infected patients had T cells against all three types of viral proteins. The membrane, nucleocapsid, and spike proteins, while the mRNA groups only induced T cells against spike proteins, which was as expected. But the unexpected part is that the mRNA vaccine virtually did not induce any subset of memory T cells called CD69+ and CD103+ resident memory T cells. Let's break this down. Now, memory T cells have two types. Central memory T cells are located in secondary lymphoid tissues, such as lymph nodes. But resident or tissue memory T cells are memory T cells that have migrated to the peripheral tissues during an initial infection or vaccination. Now they express high level of integrin, which allows them to quickly migrate to the sites of infection or inflammation and be activated by antigen-presenting cells at the site. Although the mRNA vaccine also induced tissue memory T cells, they lack CD one zero three and the production of CD one zero seven A. CD one zero three is also known as integrin alpha four. The CD one zero three is thought to be important for the long term maintenance of T cells in epithelial tissues, allowing them to provide rapid and effective immune responses against pathogens that enter these tissues. 
and CD107A is also known as lysosomal associated membrane protein 1. Now it is used as a marker for degranulation, a process by which cytotoxic granules are released from the T cells and directed toward viral infected target cells. I know those explanations were too sciencey. So in layperson's term, according to this new study, the mRNA vaccine does not appear to make the body produce tissue memory T cells that can provide rapid T cell responses in the lung for long-term maintenance. Now, in contrast, natural infections induce this special populations of memory T cells. Now the bottom line is that we will encounter new Omicron subvariants or even a completely new variant that is a major concern in the future. But so far, our immunity from infection, vaccination, and accompanations appear to hold up against the worst disease outcomes, which is ventilations, uh, with mechanical means and deaths. Now, this confirms immunological memory from either infection or vaccination. Now, while antibodies are short-lived, memory T cells appear to be robust and um, the infection seems to produce better or more multifunctional memory T cells than the mRNA vaccine, according to the study that we just went through. Now, although we don't know how this translates to clinical outcomes, it is an important piece of evidence to guide future vaccination recommendations. Now, last week, I just uh, gave a lecture on immunological memory and vaccines to my students. The classical definition of a vaccine is that it has to be safe, effective, and induced long-term immunity. Unfortunately, the long-term immunity of the mRNA vaccine is still not completely clear, and we keep boosting more frequently than we would like, and especially when manufacturers are also reluctant to share their data with the public. Now, the second part of this video I know is quite in-depth about immunology, but don't worry, I have a complete lecture on immunological memory and vaccines on my Classroom Pro channel. Now, so if you want to learn more, check that out and come back again to watch the second part of this video to see if it can uh, make more sense to you or if, if you can learn more out of it. Now, that is all for this week. I thank you very much for watching. Now, next week, we will be back to discuss broader health uh, wellness content. If that interests you, I hope to see you again. Well, my motto is eat healthily and stay healthy. Take good care. Bye.